My Future, as the title of this program suggests, is an effort that is aimed at securing a brighter future for Zimbabwe's young people. And so each week we bring in different Zimbabweans of school going age from across the country to interact with a different policy maker each week and in this case we're talking about cabinet ministers and today we are focusing on the ministry of primary and secondary education the honorable minister lazarus dokora is our guest in the studio tonight and we look forward to a very engaging discussion with him speaking to him will be a panel that is led by kimberly guineo she is from harare province takani majoko from masringo province and love mota fumane from Chitungwiza. Honorable Minister, a pleasure to have you here. It's my pleasure to be with you. And these are the young people that you will be speaking to tonight. We look forward to a very engaging and insightful discussion. They are my responsibility, so I'm happy to be here. All the way from Ashingo is Takani Majoko, and she will go first. Go ahead, young lady. Since we all know that um, education is our priority, I want to know what is being done about the children who stay in the satellite areas because they do not have access to good schools. And if they do, you find that they have no furniture, they have no classrooms, and these children enjoy having to walk long distances. So, what is being done? Thank you for that question. I think in my answer to you, the effort will be to give you some idea of the background to why we have a challenge in that area. You will probably recall that in 2000 the land reform was at its peak, moving several thousands of families into new uh, resettlement areas. At the same time, our capacity to maintain and build new structures in the existing schools has not been matched by the growth of the student population. A number of factors obviously uh, intervene there. So in 2013, the Ministry of Primary and Secondary Education um, had a conference to analyze this problem. And we came to the very uncomfortable conclusion that in fact what we saw as a problem in the satellite institutions was widespread across our nation. These uh, 2056 school institutions that needed to be um, put up. For some it may be rehabilitating a number of structures for others, it's a complete makeover, uh, building a new institution altogether, which is the characteristic uh, that satellite schools lend themselves to most readily. And to that extent, therefore, we were able to categorize the number of schools that we had to build, starting from saying in a ward how many primary schools are required and what state are those that are in place oh. and then move on to look at the complete district, the province and so on. So out of that um, conference in 2013, we then presented a proposal to government to say how do we unlock uh, this um, uh, barrier to uh, learning and indeed quality. Uh, education for all our children in the system. I'm happy to say that uh, on 17 February this year, the government agreed uh, to allow us to run with joint venture partnerships in the delivery of um, infrastructure for, for education. What that joint venture partnership does is it brings into the fold, it brings onto the table private capital coming to play a significant part in the delivery of infrastructure. Honorable Minister, uh, when you mention private capital, we immediately picture capitalists who are out to make as much money as they can. Uh, is, this, is there no potential there of perhaps exploiting or uh, maybe pushing uh, the education out of the reach of these uh, people? 
obviously when you look at the local market where capital is expensive and we had uh, certain thresholds that we had said a joint venture partner cannot charge beyond a certain uh, frame or a certain threshold in terms of their costs and interest we have to look much further beyond our borders to look for cheap money money that could come into the country at uh, 0 0.25 percent interest or rising to something like 1.5 percent interest those kinds of margins so obviously we are talking volumes here mm -hmm. not one school or one classroom block here and so on we are talking volumes and these are the kind of serious partnerships that we have now been given the green light by cabinet to engage so that we can deliver as quickly as possible on this front. And in fact, we have a test case. We must deliver the first 100 schools in the shortest possible time and then see how this works out. And then we move on to the balance of the schools in phases. Can and we hold you to, when you say shortest possible time, can we hold you to a time frame to say by this date? I think as soon as we are clear on the contracts that we are developing at the moment, I'll be able to come back to a public domain and actually indicate that that shortest possible time has now been worked out to so many months. Let me now hand over to Kimberly Guineo. She's also got a burning question. My question is in two parts and it's pertaining to children with disabilities. Many of them are shunned away and left in homes and whilst others go to schools. I was asked, my question is on the creation of special schools for them if the ministry is doing anything towards that. And also when these special schools have been created, these children then have a problem because they're put together as children with a certain disability. And when they then are put out into the world, they have problem with interaction with other people. Does the ministry also incapacitate incap anything for this? We, we talk of promoting and facilitating inclusive education. The idea of separating children on account of perceived physical characteristics is wrong. It is far much better to teach children of different, different abilities, even in terms of their physical makeup, their thinking capacities, and so on. They should learn under the same uh, conditions. It's important because in a real life, you never get smart kids doing their own thing on their own. Yeah? yeah? The smart thing to do is to work together. The kid who takes a little more time to uh, conceptualize a matter and the kid who is uh, quick and uh, light-footed, they should work together, collaborate, so that the journey is based on teamwork. So we will not be putting up schools for the disabled uh, kids. No. That phenomenon is, is historical we must facilitate their integration in the mainstream education. How do we do this? We must have teachers who are skilled to handle the children with different abilities, uh, different uh, um, uh, forms of uh, self-presentation in their particular cl classes. And this is the way to go. Let me stop you there, Honourable Minister, only because we need to take a short break now. It's my future. We're speaking to the Honourable Minister of Primary and Secondary Education. Already many topical issues have been discussed. More on the way. My future returns shortly. Well, we thank you for staying with us. My future now continues. The Honorable Minister of Primary and Secondary Education is our guest in the studio tonight. And we're continuing. Uh, we're taking questions from our panel here. Okay. Love more. Please go ahead. What has the government done uh, to make uh, e-learning being vivid in schools uh, through Wi-Fi networks and other electrical gadgets? I think that... Um the project that I described, where we are wanting to deliver a modernized infrastructure for our education system, that delivery 
will necessarily be accompanied by laboratories for ICTs and where we cannot put laboratories in place will certainly ensure that the new schools also have laptops right and because you can put laptops in any classroom they will they'll, they'll sit with you and it's, it's easier to secure them as well right and then obviously as we uh, deepen this uh, path we expect it to be playing a ball with the Minister of ICT because they are mandated to provide the backbone of communication and we ride on that backbone tap into it in order to link our schools with head office to link our schools with our uh, curriculum development unit we have huge, huge um, uh, potential to develop content which we can then uh, distribute to all our school institutions. And we have been looking at whether it's expensive, more expensive to do it via satellite, via the internet, or some other uh, uh, way of delivering that content. So we would want schools to be connected, to be online, as, uh, um, uh, as, a, as a necessity of today's uh, globalizing world. We've got a gentleman uh, from Chitungwiza who would like to engage with the minister. Go ahead. Looking uh, at our all level pass last year, it was below 25% and the rest nearly 75%. What has been done to those children? Because the government schools tend to reject those students. Let me explain what these things mean. If you write one subject at all level, if you get a credit in that subject, ZIMSEC will issue a certificate for that one subject that you have written and passed. Now, other persons have now, through um, precedence as it were, because the Public Service Commission, when it takes its uh, employees, it then says it requires those that have five credits at all level. But that is if you wish to work for government, not as a universal yardstick of whether you have passed or not. Because you can have one subject and you get a credit for it. You have passed. And then two subjects, three subjects, four subjects, etc. And you do know from experience that those who go into vocational technical uh, centers to learn about cookery, bakery, and so on, they don't need to have five or levels as if they're going to go into work in government. They will go in with those two subjects that are critical to the bakery, food and nutrition, and the science subject, and they go in. But to, we had schooled ourselves as a nation into thinking somehow there's a magical five subjects. That is not the case. However, that's not making an argument to say our system as is is necessarily efficient. No. Uh -huh. I'm, I'm the first person who will tell you it's not as efficient as it should be and we don't need some of its uh, loads of uh, uh, theoretical and academic uh, pursuits. Mm -hmm. We must diversify the curriculum. Talking about pass rates, and now specifically, I'm, uh, I'm concerned here about the rural schools, the schools from uh, impoverished areas. When you look at, uh, now we see the statistics published all the time, top 100 schools, it's always the same sort of schools that are featuring up there. Is there a way that you are trying to address those who are consistently doing badly to bring them up, whether it's allocate, more allocation of resources or uh, sending better qualified teachers there. So, in effect, they, they may not be left behind by these ones that are constantly able to, to achieve. Well, first of all, I, I, I don't know how much stock of meaning you, you put on that um, um, so-called top 100 schools. Um, because when you do the analysis of that list, it's issued by ZIMSEC. Uh -huh. um, and, and you look at the, the way it's constructed, a school with uh, three kids sitting grade seven and the three kids pass 
it's 100 percent isn't it mm -hmm. and then a school with over 150 kids and 120 of them pass this school is considered to have done poorer than the first school with only three kids who have passed so what are the benchmarks we have raised questions about that so that matter will be revised going forward mm -hmm. because it's not communicating a correct message my future takes a break do stay with us Well, thank you for staying with us on My Future. My name is Farai Mwakutuya, and joining us in the studio tonight is Honorable Lazarus Dokora, the Minister of Primary and Secondary Education, and he's speaking to a panel of young people from different parts of Zimbabwe. Uh, there are other participants in the panel here. There's a microphone roving, and I will invite some questions uh, from the panel. My issue here is on the well-being of the teachers, our beloved teachers in this country. It is general knowledge that um, other civil servants, like the soldiers and the police, on the payroll of the government, or rather the payroll of us, the people of the country, through taxes. But what I wanted to ask, can't we include our beloved teachers on that same payroll? Thus, um, we can prevent strikes and so forth, which end up affecting our studies. The mother payroll for government includes teachers mm -hmm. and the other branches of government that, uh, that you mentioned. So in that sense, it's the same parentage that's uh, doing the, uh, the, the distribution of whatever national resources are av available. I will deal with that matter of teachers in respect of what our mandate entails. We have said, as we deliver on the new schools, for instance, and including the old ones, uh, the existing ones, we must take care of the teacher's accommodation. It's a cost driver in how a teacher subsists as a professional person. Every school should have some housing that is reserved for the teachers. We must build the houses or in the urban areas we must have a quarter reserved for the, for the teachers. Secondly, you have also heard me speak in public fora to say that every school, if we can get that, should have a school bus. We have seen a lot of uh, distortion in the market for the school buses. But we want to get the, the cost down by working on the volumes. And then, of course, the, it's largely the Chinese companies that have been delivering on the buses. But we expect that they will be as assembled here and uh, tropicalized, as it were, made suitable for our terrain. But the idea behind every school a school bus, or at least a cluster, some school buses that they can have access to, is to ensure that the transportation of the teacher from the house where he lives to the school is taken care of. Because every school must be saying to itself, how do our teachers arrive for work? We expect them to be at work at 7.30. Not every one of the teachers has a vehicle. And so you take care of the transportation, you take care of their accommodation. Those two things have been the major cost drivers in any uh, citizen's life. Mm -hmm. And we expect that uh, uh, as we go into this phase of uh, uh, reform of uh, education, every parent community will embrace these areas. Honorable Minister, you talk about parents coming on board to uh, meet these uh, issues such as housing and transport. Many parents are already struggling to pay fees. Uh, they are already burdened with so many other costs. Realistically, do you think they'll be able to meet this be, additional um, cost? You will be amazed at the commitment that the parents have towards the education of their children. Mm -hmm. Remember, uh, my earlier reference, I said in the 1980s, we had a building fund that was contributed to by every child. And I'm bringing that back 
But the circumstances because have changed. The circumstances have changed, but the rates will also be such that they take the circumstances that have changed into account. But we cannot avoid the fact that here we are, growing as a population, but not taking care of the infrastructure needs of a school. So when we send a child to school, we have the responsibility, the attendant responsibility, to house those that are going to be uh, teaching our children. Because I have 8,500 schools in the country. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's okay. Well, uh, unless if there are any who would like to share with the minister, but we'll continue with our discussion. Young lady, please go ahead with your question. What about the people who are already in the schools for only the disadvantaged? What are you doing for them to prepare them for reality and for the world? Okay, thank you for that question. Yes, we have some uh, schools that were constructed in that period of our history when we um, perhaps thought that to isolate them was to try and give them the best attention. Um, the grants that those schools get are much higher than grants that go to the rest of the schools. The, there tends also to be a concentration of skilled personnel in those schools. So the two things are going for them. Um, I went to um, a school called Hen uh, Henry Mare in, um, in the Morgenstern area in Mashingo um, to, to, to see what they were doing. They make um, beautiful uh, tables, they make beautiful chairs, they also make caskets, uh, coffins, um, and uh, the specialized uh, tuition that they are receiving there. Um, and we were very satisfied that although they are in isolation in the sense that they are not uh, with the rest of the kids, um, in that school they have started to admit kids who do not necessarily share the same characteristics as the ones. In other words, conforming to the inclusive education uh, policy now. The Honorable Deputy, uh, the Honorable Minister, sorry, the Junior Minister, Honorable uh, Junior Minister of... Uh, I thought for a while... My <laughs> your deputy. <laughs> <laughs> the Honorable Junior Minister, uh, I know, has a question regarding issues of corporal punishment, which is another raging debate. Let me allow it to go ahead. My question is on corporal punishment. What, why was it introduced? Because we find that a lot of people, or most of the teachers, they do not agree with us because they feel like this is the reason why children are no longer taking their work seriously and it's causing indiscipline in schools. So we would appreciate if you would explain to us the benefits of corporal, of removing oh. corporal punishment. You know, on, uh, thank you for that question, Honorable. You know on this question I would have uh, benefited <laughs> from yourselves giving me your views on this matter. Do you start to work harder because there is a stick hanging over your head? And who should be administering that corporal punishment on you? Is it your parents? Is it my teachers? How shall we measure the strength of the beating? Shall we call in the physicists? <laughs> mm -hmm. to measure speed, impact, and so on. So, each time I read in the media that one of our school heads beat up a young child and this child then dropped and uh, the next day we are told the child died. A part of me also dies. The child may have had predisposing factors because nobody comes to school. Remember I said we practice inclusive education. Some have conditions to do with the heart. Some have conditions that predispose them to fits. And you take a stick judiciously believing this is the only way to correct this child. I think we are going the wrong way. Today's society, you are more enlightened. 
more informed and our teachers more skillful. They have studied the psychology of the young mind, the maturation of stages that you go through. When you are 17 and you start to be uh, a bit uh, restless, it's not an accident. It's part of your maturational journey. So you need guidance. So I think there are more benefits deriving out of an educational program which channels your energies towards productive outputs. Mm -hmm. So you're saying teachers should be more creative, talk to students as opposed to using the rod? Certainly, because the risks of using the, the, the stick are much higher. And I wouldn't want a situation where our education system is known for its brutalization of young people. Back in the days when I was in school, I had an old Latin teacher who used to say, hot bottom makes cool head. So clearly, <laughs> there is a, a contradiction there. But uh, my future, we must end it here. But there's still so many other issues that these young people have. So we are going to have a second program with the Honorable Minister uh, to continue and discuss more issues to do uh, with the education sector. Uh, this is my future. We must wrap up this edition here, but we will continue with this discussion on our next program. So be sure to stay tuned to that. I must thank Honorable Dokora for coming through. My name is Farang Wakutuya. This is the panel. See you again next time when we continue this discussion. Good night. <laughs>